All right. Praise the Lord, family. Hey, this is Tuesday Night Live Bible Study with FDT Catalyst or the Catalyst at FDT. I am Vincent Gord. I'm excited to be your facilitator on this night. I am um, I'm filling in for Pastor Tamika, who normally runs this. And so tonight uh, you get to have uh, Pastor Vince. I am excited to be able to share this time with you. One, I hope that you are in a safe place, that you're in a place or in a uh your your setup you got your bible you got your uh your 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 pen and paper you got everything ready you got you know you got your water so you can stay hydrated you know make sure that you that you're okay so we can <clears throat> keep our our throat all uh all, all ready and as we get ready to go into the word on tonight sorry as we get ready to go into the word on tonight it is my goal for us to uh for us to be able to not just walk away with uh with truth for not just to walk away with uh, revelation, but uh, prayerfully also something to encourage you as we go forward in uh, in everything that's happening right now. Um, I'm quite sure that you've probably heard plenty of things on the news, some new information. Uh, I also heard about um, on today, I believe it was San Francisco that that set up a a citywide a citywide shutdown. And they're restricting people from being able to go outdoors at all, except for to maybe exercise, run, walk a walk a dog or an animal. And if you see someone on the street, you're supposed to give each other six feet of of walkway or of distance to literally uh, encourage uh, the social distancing. And uh, I realize that social distancing is a new term, uh, but it's I want to say this is a tactic and a ploy that the enemy has had and he's been trying to use for a long time. And he's been trying to separate the body of Christ and separate people from being able to stay connected, to be engaged and be engaging. And so right now, uh, here, here we go. So right now, I really want to make sure that we work closely specifically on uh, what the word has what we're going to have tonight and uh, i believe that we just started a new book the new book that we're in right now is the resilient faith book this is a i don't know if you can see that yeah mm. resilient faith book and we are walking through this resilient faith book tonight's lesson is uh it's called active faith and so we're going to talk about active faith. But while we talk about active faith, I'm going to uh, we're going to go through some scripture. We're going to look at some 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 parallels in the scripture. We're going to look at some other places where we watch active faith uh, be modeled for us to be able to follow, and then for us to be able to kind of uh, to, for us to model also for the world. Uh, you know, the, the best way for us to learn in this case is for us to learn, first of all, by obedience, not just by experience. So if we can learn by someone else's experience, we can learn by what they they're teaching us. Then we apply it to our lives. We get the opportunity to get victory. So I want to pray. I want to get into this uh, and our message or our, I'm sorry, our lesson comes from first Peter. But before we go any further, I'm going to pray for all of you who are on the calling family who are calling in. Uh, I encourage you guys to uh, to stay connected. Thank you for sharing the conference call number uh, so that others can be able to call in. If you know somebody who is not Internet savvy, but you want them to be able to participate on tonight and you want them to participate in the call. I want you to have them call, uh, have them call the the uh, conference call number. The conference call number is. Um, six zero five four seven five six three three three. Again, that number is six zero five six six zero five four seven five six three three three. And they can go ahead and call in with that number. And the conference call uh join number, if they're calling in, is right. 605-475-6333 and the join number is <laughs> they're gonna find that out i'm gonna let you know in a few seconds anyway come on let's pray father we thank you we love you because you're good you do all things well uh, your name is wonderful your promises are yes and amen and i thank you lord for open ears for hearts that are prepared, break up the follow ground, Lord, break up the broken places. Um, I thank you, Father, for just allowing your Holy Spirit to be the teacher and the guide on this evening. We love you. We invite your presence, Lord, to do everything and whatever you want. We are not bound to an individual or specific way, Lord. However you want to flow, whatever you want to do, we say have your way. We are excited to flow with you to do what pleases you and brings you joy. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
All right, so that conference call number for the people who are not active online, but you want somebody to stay connected with us, the phone number again is 605-475-6333, and the join number is 344-636. So that's the code to join this call. It's 344-636, and then press the pound key, and then you can join the call, and they can listen in. All right, so let's get a little closer. Let's get on in. Hey, hey, uh, I see uh, I see my family checking on in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Surprise, it's not Pastor T. It's me. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, let's look at this. First of all, um, when we talk about resilient faith, the word resilient in itself means that it is uh, something that has been tried, tested, that is proven, that is uh, that is resisted, that has overcome, that has um, that has navigated through. And I've used that that word a lot this week. And when I say navigate through, I realize that that you know David says, "Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel no evil." Um, and when he see, says those words, uh, it's only because. He says, for thou art with me, your rod and your staff, you come for me. In other words, that the Lord is leading him through this valley that seems like it is the worst of the worst, where it seems like everything around him reeks of death, where it seems like everything around him is out to kill him. It desires to destroy his life and take his life. And so when he says those words, he says them with the intent or the idea to emphasize the fact that I don't know the way through this, but you do. And when we talk about resilient faith, we're talking about faith that trusts and that is pressed through some uncomfortable situations, uh, the, 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 what looks like the valley of the shadow of death, what looks like situations that are, are, are uncomfortable, that are uh, strenuous, that are overwhelming, or what might even seem or, or be regarded as uh, stressful. Uh, these are the things that I want to, I want to say the, these are the, 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 this is the calisthenics for growing our faith. Faith is like a muscle. I said this on Sunday. Faith is like a muscle. And the Lord desires for us to be able to be strong in our faith. The scripture says he's given it to us, all of us, the measure of faith. You can find that in Romans chapter 12. And we all have a portion or a measure. All of us have muscle substance. Nobody's born just bones. Everybody has some, some portion of muscle. It's what we do with the muscle that oftentimes uh, allows us to go from uh, average events or average uh, uh, feats to great powerful feats, to feats of great strength. And if our faith is like a muscle, then there should be areas of or feats of great faith that should be accomplished in our life as our faith gets stretched or tested or becomes resilient. In other words, as we get it stretched or the gymnast or the pulling of what happens and the, what happens with just like a muscle, it's the tearing of the muscle that, that what happens is the little micro tears in the muscle as you're going to the gym and as you're working out and, and, it, and those micro tears begin to, uh, the, the muscle or the, the body begins to repair. But what it says is so that this does not happen again, this tear doesn't happen again, it fortifies that muscle and gives it extra tendon so that it won't tear again but what it actually does is it makes it stronger it gives it more flexibility it gives it more resilience in other words it allows it to be able to endure more stress more weight more uh, reps more more pain uh, but what it does also is it allows the muscle to be built up so when we talk about faith I want you to imagine faith as like a muscle and when we talk about resilient faith we're talking about faith that is literally going to the gym OK, we're talking about faith that is pushing through, that is overwhelming, that is not being sub subdued or easily overcome, but that is pressing through. So, excuse me. Turn to First Peter, chapter one. And this uh, this passage is going to specifically reference um, verses 14 through uh, for the most part, we're going to go from 14 to 25. But let's look at that. Uh, it says that for, for followers of Jesus. The problem with our habit of blending in is that the Bible causes us to be set apart. In fact, scriptures command us to think and behave differently than the world around us. This has nothing to do with fashion or branding, but has everything to do with lifestyle and character. We're called to be holy, to be set apart, just as Jesus is holy. Right now, more than ever, 
is a great example, a great opportunity for us to be able to be exactly that, for us to be the light, for us to stand out. And when I say stand out, that doesn't mean that we go out and do things that are foolish or that put our families or our lives in danger. No, it's about making sure that we do things that uh, that that allow the world to see that, yes, we're being wise. Yes, we're being safe. We're being compliant to the laws of the land. However, our faith is greater than what we than the things that we see in the natural. In other words, our faith is not dictated by our circumstance. We allow our circumstances to be dictated by our faith because we believe what God says. And when we believe what God says, we speak what he says and then it becomes manifest. And, and here's the thing. You don't immediately see it. Sometimes you'll say it and it takes a while. So here's where the scripture says, you know. Uh, uh, write the vision to make it plain that he may run that read it uh, because sometimes us speaking it until we see it until we see what he says uh, uh, seem, can seem like it's going to take a lifetime or it takes a lifetime here's the thing though we cannot be moved by our circumstances or be moved by when we see it happen we just have to continue to confess and believe what God says and that until we see what he says until we see that thing manifest until we see that thing come to pass we're going to keep pressing through we're going to keep believing we're going to keep pressing for pressing forward does that make sense so let's look at um, let's look at a few scriptures and let's kind of go in first Peter chapter one. And I'm going to start at uh, verse. It says 14 through 19. I'm going to start at 13 and start at the beginning of the paragraph marker. And uh, let's just start from there. It says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your heart, be sober and hope to the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which calleth, which called you, is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Pause for a second. This is a call to action, all right? And Peter is writing, and <clears throat> he's writing to the body of Christ in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia uh, and Bithynia. Uh, and, and so he's writing to believers, and he's encouraging them about making sure that they are specific with their standard, that they don't compromise, that they don't conform. Uh, I love how Romans 12 tells us, uh, you know, uh, I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, the least that you can do. And then the last, next part says, and be not conformed to this world. In other words, we can't do everything. We can't be, even though he calls us sheep, we can't operate in herd mentality. Be not conformed to the world. And when you... The word conform literally means to take on the image of or to take on the the, the, the likeness of when uh, I don't know if you remember uh, growing up, uh, there was uh, my brother uh, from my brother's age because he's, you know, he's older than me. But um, my brother, uh, I remember he used to have uh, um, <laughs> now I don't know if, if, if it was that he had it or if it was left over. From a, from a previous time when he used to play. And I just happened to kind of discover some of these things, uh, whether it was from him or our, I can't remember, it might have been my older cousin, Guy Guy. But uh, the, there was this thing called Silly Putty. I don't know if you all remember Silly Putty. Anybody old enough to remember Silly Putty? Silly Putty. So Silly Putty, uh, it, it was uh, the 60s, uh, it was a 70s version of, 70s, 80s version of today's slime. It, it wasn't as snotty and nasty. It, it was a little more like, clay uh and more free form and you can sculpt it and you can put it on stuff and it would take the image of the colors and of off the newspaper and it would be on the silly putty in other words you could kind of shape it and grip it and so we grab the silly putty and uh sometimes we would grab it and we try to squish it in our hands as hard as we could and then we let it go and the silly putty would take on the shape of the void of the inside of our hand and so you can see all the creases of your finger and you can see the, 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 the creases of the lines inside your hand. And, and so when you let it go, it showed the image of what the inside of your fist looked like. And we just thought that was so amazing. We thought it was so cool, you know. Um, and when we would play with it, what I realized is um, it would take on the shape of whatever I pressed it against. Having said that now, when I say it takes on the shape of what I pressed it against, then that means the pressure of what is around it 
forms it into that thing. So when you read the scripture, it says, be not conformed to this world. Literally what it's saying is the pressures of this world will like to shape you in the fashion of what it wants to make you. Just like that silly putty. It wants to squeeze you into the form that it wants to make you into. It wants to squeeze you into believing that that this is the best that it's going to get. It wants to squeeze you into believing that you should just settle. And why, I don't even know why, you, why you, you, you're praying. I don't know why you're doing what you're doing. It wants to squeeze you into believing that it's not going to get... Uh, it, it's only going to get worse. So, so just give up now. These are the, these are the kind of things that the enemy was love to conform us. With. When the scripture says, "Be not conformed to the world," it doesn't mean just act like the world. It means don't be pressured by the world to take on its image. Because remember now, when he says this, uh, when he writes that, he's writing that with the intent and the idea to. to he's, he's writing it to believers who are operating first of all with kingdom mentality already. He doesn't have to preach the kingdom to them. They already know it. He didn't have to preach to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They already knew that. So what he's telling them is, as you're trying to live this holy life, don't let the pressures of everything around you conform you to be like them. So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's where our faith then begins to kick in. And when we grow about, uh, we, we learn that our faith requires us to have to push back. We can't be conformed. Now, look at what Peter's saying in 1 Peter. And he says, wherefore, gird up your loins. In other words, tighten yourself up. Don't let the world tighten you up. You tighten yourself up. When he says gird up your loins, there, there literally was a garment that they used to wear, kind of like a, uh, uh, for, for, better, for lack of a better description, like Spanx ladies. And so this garment would be like this girl that would help to, to uh, the, the, the priests or others to help to hold um, uh, the, their, their, their uh, help to protect and their, hold their, their loins together. Um, you know, just, just kind of like reinforcements, especially, you know, you lift this stuff, you're moving stuff. It, it, it makes it so that you're protected, right? So when you look at that, he says, gird up your loins uh, of your mind. So watch this. We're not just talking about a physical garment on your body. He's talking about hold your mind together. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. And when we say sober, we're talking about, or we're not just talking about uh, uh, indulging in, in alcohol. We're not just talking about that. We're, when we're talking about sober, we're also meaning alert and we, we mean to stay focused. And so when he says, keep your mind together, stay focused, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Christ. Now, when we talk about grace, we're talk, when we, you define grace, grace is the authority and the power of God. Hey, Pastor Alfred, how you doing? Uh, and so watch this. So when we say that, we're, we're talking about this, this, this authority and this power that is given specifically for this time. Once you receive the revelation of who Jesus Christ is, he says, hold on, get your head together because you're going to need this power that you're going to get because of what you're going to have to endure and go through, which means... <clears throat> If anybody ever lied to you and told you that when you get saved, your life is going to be wonderful, it's going to be all a bowl of cherries, and Jesus is with you, and yes, he is with you. However, uh, when people come and give their life to the Lord at our church, I, I'm honest with them. I tell them, listen, this is the best decision that you ever made in your life, and I'm excited. Right now, there are angels rejoicing in heaven over you, but I also tell them, right now, you are also now raised on your level of the enemy's hit list and most wanted list. And he hates the fact that he lost you and he would love even the more the fact to be able to grab you back and to make you forget, make you, make you regret this decision that you made. So you need this power that Paul Peter's telling us about. You're going to need this power that's going to take for us to navigate through the things that are going to come up going forward as we declare the revelation of this king. And when we talk about the king of we're talking about Jesus Christ. We are talking about a king. We're not just talking about a savior, right? So let's just recap again. Anybody remember that? <laughs> right. Uh, uh, our co-pastor Corby used to tell us in a minute, you know, get, uh, draw your mind in, uh, 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 get your mind and bring your mind and bring your mind together. Uh, when we talk about um, about Christ as king, not just savior, a savior is kind of a scapegoat for sin. But when we talk about a king and a king who then now takes your place because of sin, because you've committed treason, or when I say you, you've committed treason, well, what is the sin or what is sin? It is trying to be in the place of God. 
When you read Genesis chapter two and you look at what drew uh, Eve to the to the tree, uh, the serpent's word specifically was, uh, surely there's good. And she saw the good in the tree and she was drawn to the good specifically after he said, it'll make you like God. Yes, we desire to reflect the image of God, but to take his position or take his rightful place as ruler, as the one who has authority to make decisions and choose uh, where, where our lives go, uh, that should not be ours, but rather it's his. Now, what that, and when I say that, I, I don't mean, you know, ball up your life plan and, and, and don't make goals. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is make priorities. If he's your first priority, Lord, if you're the first thing in my life, watch this. Uh, he doesn't want to be everything in our lives. He wants to be the first thing. So when we allow him to be the first thing, then everything else begins to fall in place. When we do it that way, he'll let you know what needs to be next. He'll show you a direction on how you need to flow. And then when you're not sure and you think this is the way he wants you to go, I encourage you, try it. Because here's the thing. The only time that you fail is when you don't try if you thought that was God. If you think it's God, but you're not sure and you don't do it, that's when you fail. But if you think it's God and you try and you step out, here is where the muscle of faith gets stretched. Here is where the resilience becomes manifest. Here is where the, the workout happens, the gymnasium for your, for your faith. And what happens is your faith begins to get stronger as he rewards your faith for being obedient when you thought you got him. Now watch this. If you mess up and it wasn't God that you thought it was him, here's where you still win. You realize, okay, Lord, that wasn't you, but I'll be more intentional the next time. So I'm going to learn from this one. Here's the thing. You don't lose when you try, try to please God. You only lose when you don't try to please God. That makes sense? All right. So let's look at this. Uh, verse 14, it says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lust in your ignorance. In other words, don't try to go back to the things that you used to do and the way that you used to live. Verse 15 but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The same way that he's holy, follow his example, follow his lead, model what he's giving us to follow. He says, be part of uh, the verse 16 says, for it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Be ye holy for I am holy. Uh, I love the fact that uh, the Lord is circlic in nature. And when I mean circlic in nature, um, the scripture says that he's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. In other words, there is a pattern that's going on here. You see a circle in his circlic nature. And when you see that, uh, when he, he defines himself to Moses, and when Moses says, well, who shall I say sent me? He says, tell him I am sent you. Well, what I am, well, whatever you need, that I am. I am sent you. So when we when we say you're whatever I need you to be, you're the I am you are, Lord. When we say those words, we say stuff like that. What we're really saying is uh, I realize that there is no end with you. Like a ring, it is eternal. There is no space or no area that you are ignorant or that you are not involved in, that you are not connected to, or you're not a part of. So if you're a part of all of it, if you're if you're uh, if you're actively in all of it, then that means, Lord, I can also trust you and know that you got my end in mind because you see the end before the beginning you're already there you already see it your plan is already set so it's my job now <clears throat> while i'm in time to model what you have defined in eternity holiness now watch this that does not mean that you're perfect he said be holy being holy means you are set aside. The word sanctification means to be set aside specifically for the use of God. When they used to set uh, animals aside for sacrifice, they would set them aside for sacrifice so that the people could be able to uh, uh, could be able to uh, make sure that there was no spot or or that there was no uh, a blemish on the lamb before it was sacrificed before the Lord. I said that to say this. Uh, it was also put aside so that it can be observed. When you are sanctified or when you set your life aside, and I know people don't preach about sanctification no more, but let me just tell you about it. What that means is when you give your life to the Lord, you're choosing to be set aside to be observed so the world can see if there's a spot or a blemish in you. And then if they do find one, because honestly, they're going to find it. You've got them. But here's what the blood of Jesus does. The scripture says his blood covers a multitude of sin. 
when you look at the 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 the, the standard that God gave uh, the the Levites on how to offer the scapegoat and how one goat was covered in the blood of the other, that one died, but the other one was covered in the blood of that one, so you couldn't see any spots, you couldn't see anything. All you saw was the blood on a lamb. What the world needs to see is the blood of Jesus on us. When we live this life in a way so that no one else can get the glory but him, he wants to do it in such a way so that he can get the glory. And when he gets the glory, you're covered. They can try to inspect. They can try to find the spots in your life and they might find a few. But here's the deal. I've chosen to be, have my life set aside and I choose to try to be holy. And when I mean try to be holy, I mean that when you mess up, openly that you confess and you fix up openly and that when you when you when you jack up you you need to properly handle things listen i had messed up plenty of times and and quite honestly there, there is no reason why i should be where i am right now except for the blood of jesus that covers me and i promise you uh, and it's, it, it ain't pretty to be covered in the blood it, it, it's it's messy but i choose it because he chose us watch this he chose me and my mess in spite of who I was, in spite of who I thought I was, in spite of everything that I thought I was going to do and all, and how great we think we are, man, it's amazing how we how we envision ourselves and how the Lord actually sees us. And so I encourage you, ask the Lord to show you what he sees, because oftentimes what we see is not the same thing he sees. And what he sees is the blemishes, but he also loves your flaws. He also still sees you and he says, that's why I made you just like that. You're the only one like that. And I made you so that you need my mercy, you need you need my grace that you need my power that you need my authority i made you like that so that we can have this relationship so that i can be able to fill this void that you require so i can be that void filler so that i can stretch your faith and i can encourage you to help lift me up so that others can be drawn to me wow now let's keep going down first peter First Peter, uh, um, at verse 17, he says, or 16, he says, be ye holy for I am holy, right? Verse 17, though, says, and if you be, if you call on the Father, who without respect of person judgeth according to every man's work, passeth the time of our sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye are not redeemed by corruptible things as silver and gold or from vain conversations received by tradition of your of, from your fathers but with the precious blood of christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot dude i didn't even read that ha huh. but that's exactly what we just talked about right now watch this he says Listen, this redemption process comes because the Father requires it. And because the Father has set it up and the Father has ordained it, now uh, we're not going to be able to be redeemed with natural things. There's no gold. We, nobody can buy themselves into heaven. Uh, Warren Buffett, uh, my, uh, uh, almost called him a, uh, uh, Bill Gates, uh, the, the Fed, the, their money times their money times uh, Kennedy money times Rockefeller money can't purchase a brick of, of, of pavement in heaven. Because remember, the scripture says that, the, that the, the streets are paved with gold. If, if, if money is the trash of heaven or if gold is, is just pavement, in other words, it's, it, it has no value to him at all. What does have value is your soul. What does have value is your heart. What does have value is the position that you allow him to have in your life. That's what he's looking for. Or else he would not say, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers. Uh, watch this. The way that we get redeemed is, is, is summarized in 19. It says, but with the blood, the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. He was promised from the beginning of time. And, and if you want to know why, where you can look at it, it's Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. That's the first time that you see something die for sin. The scripture says in Genesis 3 and 21, it says, and he made coats of skin and clothed them or covered them, which means something died immediately because Adam and Eve's choice to try to be like God, not to be in relationship with God, 
to try to take his place. Now, when you look at Genesis 3 and 21, I need you to also remember the fact that Adam was there and he named all the animals. He was present with at creation. He saw everything get created. He gave them names. So just as like he was in a relationship with God, he also had a relationship with all the animals. Can you imagine, uh, you, you ever have a pet? have a pet dog or a cat or a lizard or something like that. Uh, my mother tells stories about how growing up they used to, in New York, they had a, a, a you know, a, for those of you who know my, my mother was, uh, she was the daughter of a celebrity uh, guitar folk singer named Josh White. You can Google him if you want to on another time, not right now, stay focused, let's stay right here. But growing up, uh, her brother had a monkey and, and they had uh, all different kind of weird animals. And can you imagine? Having an animal that you grew up with, whatever your pet was and your pet's name was, and and you know little little uh little Fifi, a little Fru Fru, a little dog or whatever. Uh, my grandmother had a, I think my aunt had a, a German Shepherd named King, and so when we would go over, they used to have to put King in the in the basement because the little kids we, we was we was scared of King. And uh, but could you imagine the first time that you see that you do something wrong, that King got taken in the back, killed. And they take kin, King's skin and they put it on you. Or insert your favorite pet here. Put that pet's name. Whatever, Fifi, whatever that was. And now you have to wear a coat of your, you know, childhood animal dog or cat or monkey or whatever as a covering or, in other words, as a reminder for your sin. I need you to understand that when the scripture describes specifically here that we are redeemed by the precious, precious blood of Christ as the lamb, he was the foretold one that was promised as the sacrifice for sin. Because every bull and ox and, and, and dove and goat and, and lamb that was offered in the Old Testament scripture, that was offered, a turtle doves, everything that was offered were only paid the, a portion of the sin debt that was required. So when we look at the requirement for our faith, or specifically the cause to be holy, it holy requires us to be separated, to be set apart for God, specifically so he can get the glory out of us. When we look at verse 17, though, when he talks about fear, <clears throat> he says, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. The fear that we're talking about is not terror, but reverence. We're talking about a respect. We're talking about an awe of the God, of, of the power of, of our God. And when we talk about his authority and talk about his grace, and we put him in proper perspective and put him in proper authority, uh, you begin to respect the sheer greatness of how good he is. You know, it wasn't until I traveled internationally uh, for the first time to go and preach. And it was the time that I went to... Uh, uh, not the first time. It was, it was like maybe the, the, the fifth time when I went to India. And while I was in India, uh, uh, and it was for a Christmas celebration. Uh, I had the opportunity to be able to be the speaker for a Christmas celebration. And while I was there, um, it was at a uh, <clears throat> it was at a specific place location, which I cannot disclose. Uh, but the, um, the number of believers that were accumulated who were unable to celebrate openly all year long because all the other religions have festivals. And, and so Christmas was the only time of the year uh, that Christmas and, and uh, Christmas and, and, and sometimes Resurrection Sunday, d d depending on, on what the, 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 the temperature was like. But Christmas was an easy way for them to be able to have an open celebration where they could give and gift to the community and be a blessing to the community, but also allow them to be able to show them who they served. And watch this. Their fear and their reverence of God was so great that they were willing to be ostracized, to be mis dis excommunicated from their families, to be dissolved from their families, totally, like literally taking out of wills, totally dishonored, uh, d name taking out of the family life just because they chose Christ. Watch this. If they choose to add Christ to their many gods, it was okay. But the moment that they chose to be a Christian and to exclusively serve Christ as their Lord and Savior, that is what separated them or caused them to literally receive open persecution for it. And when I think about that and think about uh, on this side of the world where we get the opportunity to freely worship and serve God whenever we want to, I don't think that we have the same kind of fear or reverence of who God is and how he can protect us and how he can keep us because we freely have the opportunity to reverence him this there's no fear uh, of, of, or, or there's no, watch this, our reverence of God is, is a little different because it, 
we don't require him to be our guide and our protector as we are serving him, as we are worshiping him, as we're giving him glory. You know, we ask the Lord to keep us from hurt, harm, and danger, and he does. Uh, but man, what if, it, if, if you choosing the name of Christ literally caused you to, to be uh, no longer invited to family, re, re, uh, family uh, re, re, Reunions, thank you. I don't know why that word escaped me. Family reunions, or you, uh, you got you you got separated from your family, where your your father, your mother would no longer uh, acknowledge your paternity or acknowledge your uh, a portion in the family, acknowledge that you're even their child, disown you, for the gospel's sake. We're talking about a, a a a quality of reverence to God, and watch this. Not so much a fear of men, but rather that I respect and I honor God more than men. The Lord, I'm willing to put you above everything. And if it requires me to lose everything, if my mother, my father forsake me, then the Lord, you'll take me up. And oftentimes we quote that scripture here, but it means so much more on that side. It means so much more when you're in a community or in an area of people who have to depend on God because that's all they have, nothing else left. Does that make sense? Let's keep going. Um, we look at the promise that was given, <clears throat> verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times unto you, who by him do, I'm sorry, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit uh, unfeigned in love of the brethren, See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Listen, he's talking about how because the Lord chose to raise him from the dead, to encourage and to empower our faith, to bring us to a place to where we can choose his, uh, choose his, his plan, his way. It gives us the opportunity now to have our life and our souls uh, not just covered in the blood, but washed pure and, and clean, uh, that our souls are purified by obeying the truth through the Spirit. And if you look at the Spirit, the Scripture says right here, it, it says T-H-E, it puts the in front of it, which means when you put the in front of something, that is a definitive article. It's not any old Spirit, it is the, and then there's a capital S on it. The capital S literally means um, that we're talking about the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God, that through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that you love one another with a pure heart. Because you've been washed clean, because you've been forgiven, you are free to do the one thing that we've been required to do. Scripture says, oh, no man, anything but love. We are free to love the Lord and to give and to love people. Watch this. Love God and love people. And he's telling them specifically to love your brethren. But watch this. When we're talking about loving people, we're not just talking about, uh, uh, you know, tolerating or being nice. Here's where I'm ex encouraging you to learn how to uh, how to suffer uh, through what some of these people, some people are dealing with because they don't totally understand why they operate what, the way they, they do. They don't understand why they hurt the way they do. And pretty much what happens is hurt people hurt people. But when you help them through loving on them, and loving on them does not mean that you become a doormat. You can still have safe boundaries when you love them. But what it means is you cannot be afraid to help to embrace them in their hurt. You cannot be afraid to, if the Lord shares and gives you the opportunity to, or he chooses for you to be the one that share your personal story with them to help them get delivered. Or maybe just to listen to their story so you can connect them with the people who they need to connect with so they can be able to get the deliverance that they need. Whatever it is, you need to be open for it. That's part of this, this whole active faith because it's not faith just believing well i'll pray for you and I'll be i believe the lord's going to take care of that for you no it's hey i'm vested the lord's delivered me and i it's my responsibility to do whatever it takes to make sure that i can connect you with what you need to be connected with so that you can get your deliverance too let's go back and let's continue i'm going back to now verse 22 and we're going to go from 22 to 25 and finish this out seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth uh verse 23 being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of men as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. 
The Lord is requiring us to be in a place in a position to where we can choose one to understand that we don't have forever. Tomorrow's not promised. We need to take advantage of the time that he's given us, not just take advantage of the time, but that we need to make best use of the time that we operate well and that we operate swiftly. And here's what active faith does. Active faith does not allow us to choose when we're going to jump in or to choose if uh, if I'll participate. He's requiring us to be in a position to where uh, uh, I need to I need to be an active portion of the solution. I can't be a part of the problem. If I know that this is an issue, then I need to be able to be the one that will stand with a loud voice and declare and, and fight against it or I need to be the one who chooses to make a different way because others won't go that way <clears throat> to live the truth by love is to live a life set apart from set apart for God a holy life now pain and suffering can have their way of leading us to God and I always say that um, the way that you people find God they find the Lord in different ways you know you, you can come to God in many different ways some people come to God through the bottom of a, of a bottle some people come to God through the end of a crack pipe. Some people come to God through uh, through the end of a needle uh, shooting up. Uh, some people come to God uh, waking up in someone else's bed and saying, "You know, this is the last, Lord. I, I, this, I, this, this isn't helping, Lord. This isn't working, Lord. I, I, God, if if you're real." And it's at that moment where they find Him. How you find Him, or wherever you find Him, that doesn't matter. It's what happens when you do. You choose this life, you receive him as your king, and you stop trying to rule yourself, but you allow him to, to, to help you put things in order, and you ask him for his will so his will can be done in your life. And now you begin to operate in this love that is so contagious that it affects others and helps them to wonder, well, what, why do you do what you do? Why, 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 do, why, are, you, why are you even talking to me right now? Why, what, what's good about today? And, and it gives you the opportunity when you say, you know, have a good day or it's a great day, isn't it? And, they're like, and they ask you what's good about it. And they begin to talk about all the bad. And here's where you get the opportunity to bring up the good because greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. And you get a chance to not be conformed by the pressures of this world, but you're transformed by the renewing of your mind because I don't think the way they used to. And I used to think like you did. I used to think like you did. I used to think that there was nothing you any better. But then I found something. I found someone and he changed my life. That's the kind of opportunity that we get the opportunity. That's the kind of opportunity that he gives us to have with our interactions as we model his holiness in the earth. Now, when we go back to uh, 23 through 25, it says specifically, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Again, no longer being conformed to the world that we are renewed or that we are born again. Verse 14, for all flesh is grass. Now, why is, is it, does Peter specifically reference this point? What is, what's important about talking about flesh being like grass and it withering and fading and the flower fades? What he, what, literally, what he's bringing to light is the fact that our mortality is an actuality. We cannot be ignorant or act like we're going to live forever. Not in this body anyway. That we have, you are an you are an eternal soul. I'm sorry, you're an eternal spirit. When the, you are a spirit being with an eternal soul that lives right now in an earth suit. I'm going to say that again. You are a uh, an a, a, a spirit being with an eternal soul that happens to live in an earth suit. What happens though while you're in this earth suit is what defines what happens in eternity. So imagine this, if you go to space, you need a space suit. If you go deep sea diving, you need a scuba suit. Well, while on earth, you're a spirit being, but while on earth, specifically in time, and watch how I said that, because when you're in space, you need a space suit. When you're in the deep, the depth of the ocean, you need the scuba suit or that, that pressurized suit. While you're in time, you need an earth suit because this earth suit allows you to operate in, in time. Remember now, you're an eternal, you, you are a spirit being. Here's what the scripture says that, that uh, you know, uh, I show you mystery that we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, and, and the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall live, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up and be like him or be translated to be like him. In other words, we will exchange or take off the, the, the earth suit because we are no longer required it to be in, in earth. So imagine like a scuba diver who goes underwater, but then when they come out of the water, what do they do? They keep walking around in that suit? No, they take it off. When a spaceman comes out of uh, orbit and he lands and he touchdowns, 
touches back down to, to earth. Does he walk around in his moon walker suit? No, he takes that off. Watch this. When we get into the presence of the Lord, will we wear this suit any longer? No, we'll take it off. So when we look at what he says here about the flesh being like grass. He's saying this suit that you're wearing right now, at some point you're going to take it off when you get in his presence. So make sure that you are wise with the time that you've been given. Having active faith while you're here in this earth suit means that you are going to move and flow and do what he's called you to do. Otherwise, you'll have to stand before him and he'll, he'll say, hey, you know, what'd you do when you were in the suit? Oh, nothing, Lord. I was waiting on you, Jesus. I was just waiting on Jesus. I was waiting on Jesus. He's going to be like, no, no, no. That, that's, not, that's not the kind of waiting I was trying to get you to do. I wanted you to wait like a waiter. I wanted you to serve. I wanted you to love like I love. I wanted you to be holy for I am holy. This, this faith requires action. Again, faith without works is dead. So it requires us to operate in a capacity where we are flowing in, uh, where it's flowing in unity. Now, let me kind of cross-reference that to where we are today, and let's kind of add some more scriptures to this. <clears throat> Turn with me to um, Turn with me to, uh, I'm going to go now to Second Peter, First Peter chapter 2. I'm going to go to, to, verse, uh, to verse 9, and it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Listen, he's saying that you are, you've are you been called out, you've been chosen. It's kind of like the draft. He's chosen you. And watch this. Even with the draft, even though when they pick players, the players still have to accept being chosen. They can deny it. They can say, ah, oh, no, nah, I don't want to. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to sign up with you all. And they can deny the offer. But the Lord is saying, I'm calling you. You're chosen. I know what you can do because I, I made you. I'm excited about using you. I want to use you for my glory. And so the way I can, the only way I can get that done is I need you to accept what I've done, accept what I'm calling you to, and I need you to get out here and be active with us. No, uh, uh, no, no draft recruit gets drafted and then sits in the locker room while everybody else warms up, while everybody else is getting, you know, you know, learn the plays. No, you don't. You don't just walk out because you got picked. No, nah, bro, you got to put that time in, put some work in, and become part of the unit, come, put, become part of the family. He's calling us to be active. And when I mean being active, I mean not just be active in a church believing body, a Bible reading, Bible believing. I'm talking about also being active in doing the work of the Lord, being an example in the light of who he is. So when we look at this, how we were not a people, we weren't a part of a team, but he's now calling us to be a part of this awesome team. He's calling us to be an example of what he's calling us to in this season. Let's keep going. I want to take you over to, uh, <clears throat> I, I want to go over to, to Romans chapter 8. Now, I'm bringing you here in Romans chapter 8 because I want to reference back the fact that in 1 Peter, uh, right in verse 24, when it talked about how, uh, again, we are like, like grass. Well, while grass grows, grass goes through, you know, seasons, right? You Sometimes you got weeds that grow. Sometimes you got stuff that grows and tries to eat the grass. In other words, the grass goes through a bunch of things as it, it, as it does what it does or as it goes through its process. I'm saying that to say this, there are some things that you're going to go through as you're a part of this process, uh, being an, a part of this active faith, uh, this active faith charge that God has given us. So when we look at it, um, I, I want you to go to Romans 8 and I want to start <clears throat> at verse 18 it says for i reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us <clears throat> for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of god for the creature were made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who hath been subject to the same in hope because the creature itself also shall not shall be delivered from bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth, travaileth, and pain together until now. And not only they, 
but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit. Again, here we get, again we see the definitive article, capital S spirit. Even ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that which we see not then with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Watch all this now. The power of what the Holy Spirit brings us to is uh, allows us to first, uh, let's identify, it's starting back in verse 18, it says, for the, I reckon the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. In other words, there is the part of, of of this this being in active faith means that there is going to be some suffering there is going to be some some issues remember i told you earlier i told you before you know if you ever heard the words or if somebody ever told you that you know being saved means you're going to have an easy walk or you know you know that that that, that was a not truth okay that was a false truth truth is it's work it requires work you know you you know you can't uh <laughs> As much as uh, plastic surgery would like to make you think that you can, uh, real changes in your body happen with physical exertion, right? Because what ends up happening is there is a uh, there is a great. Uh, there, there is a great thing that happens with the building of, of the muscle, that with the building of the body, that it allows the body to not just be able to have a shape change, but it also has a power level change. For someone who had, uh, I, I, I saw this guy online who had these uh, biceps injected. He had a, a, a silicone injected in his arms so he could look like he had big arms without going to the gym. Watch this. So they stood him up against a guy who his arms were half the size of, of the guy and they went to go push weight. And and even though the other guy had bigger arms and he looked like he was big, uh, he was not able to endure the weight or endure the process. But watch this. The one with the, with the smaller arms, but what was all hard-earned muscle was able to push through and to press through a weight that no one else could press through. Watch this. There's a whole bunch of folks who have a plastic surgery Christianity. And the plastic surgery Christianity means they look the part. They look like they're strong. They look like they got authority. They look like they got power. But man, they can't carry water. They can't go through nothing. They can't deal with no circumstances. They can't deal with no situations. And like moments like right now, when the world is acting panicked and they're going and losing their mind, you know, uh, they're, they're the ones who are who are afraid to be an example of who Christ is. But let me explain something to you. Now more than ever, I encourage you to talk about Jesus. Here is your chance. This is your chance to talk about him even more. Here's your chance. It's part of dollar. People are already talking. They, they might be talking six feet away from you, but they're still talking. Well, here's your opportunity to talk about why you have hope, why you why you still do what you do, why you still are, are trying to take take care of other people, why you why you're still trying to be there, or make yourself available because it this is this because we, we we don't have the image of what the strength looks like. We have the evidence of the strength. Watch this. The difference between the image and the evidence is what you go through. So when he says the reckoning the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed, he's saying, listen. And be ready for for a workout, but it's worth it. It's so worth it. It's worth it. Is what he's trying to tell us. Turn with me to. Uh, are, are we are we doing good? You, you you with me right there? You you with me right there? You better preach. I see. All right, all right, gay man. Stay with me. Um, <clears throat> let, let's 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 go. I want to go over to. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to stay in Romans 8. I'm going to skip down a little further because I, 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 I'm jumping out before I get to some good stuff. Let's go back to verse 27. And he searcheth the hearts, knowing what the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Talking about what the Holy Spirit does on our behalf. Next part says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Remember now, Peter told us we're called. We read this again, and, and we're, we're given the opportunity to what to 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 learn how to 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 train our heart and our mind to 
not just fall in love with the Lord. And, and again, the reason why it's so important that you understand that this verse says, all things work together for the good to them that love God. Loving God does not mean keeping a bunch of rules. Keeping a bunch of rules is religion. To love God means that you're in a relationship with him. Um, when you, when you, uh, when you go to work, you go to your job. Uh, I mean, if you can go to your job right now, maybe you can't. But for when, you know, last week when you did go to your job, <laughs> when you were able to go. Um, so when you go to your job, uh, um, do you go because you love your boss and you love your coworkers and you you love your director? Uh, no, you go there because you've made a contract. You you made an exchange. I'm exchanging my time and my expertise for this cash y'all gonna give me. And y'all better not come skip you on my cash, right? Okay. That's relate that that relationship is relegated by a contract. But relationship, real relationship uh, that's based on love is one that <clears throat> when you are in love, um you nobody has to tell you to do something for the person that you love because you love them. You just do it because you're motivated out of this desire to see them do well, to make them happy. And here's the thing. When you read Genesis 1 and 2, Adam did not have religion. God didn't give him religion. God didn't say, you know, on the third day, I made this, fourth day, he made that. And then after he made Adam, he didn't say, okay, now, Adam, on Tuesdays, I've got Bible study. And on Wednesdays, we've got, uh, we've got, uh, 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 we got prayer meeting. And on uh, Sunday, service starts at nine o'clock. God did not say that to Adam. What did God do? He walked with him. He dwelt with him in the garden. God didn't even give him a Bible. Do you, do, do you remember that? Look, go look for it. God didn't give Adam a Bible. He didn't need to. Why? Because his words were hidden in his heart. He had a relationship. He had a relationship. And they walked through communication on a regular basis every day together. They talked on a regular basis. Watch this. When you are in relationship and you're talking on a regular basis and you're in each other's presence all the time, you don't have to sit there and try to write down the rules and regulations. You own them because you love that individual. You grow in it. Hey, Callie, how you doing? So here's what happens. When you look at that and when you look at what God is calling right here, he's requiring us to, uh, when you read Romans 8 and 28, uh, again, again, this is still, still part of the active faith because in order for me to, 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 to be able to operate in active faith, it means that I first have to believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. I also have, to, and that, that's Hebrews chapter one. I also have to believe that, uh, that he, he loves me and that, God's love was so great that he gave his only begotten son. I have to believe that his love for me supersedes my shortcomings, my failures, and all the things that the enemy always wants to pick out in me and tell me that I'm bad at and tell me that I'm no good for in my life, in my mind, in my heart, in the mirror, or by people. Because, you know, he likes to use people to try to bring us down. Here's where active faith requires me to know that it says that when... Uh, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. When we talk about loving God, we're talking about having a relationship. Now, when you have a relationship with God, he don't have to ask you to pray because you talk to him. I, I, I have to be honest. I, I used to have a, like a set prayer time. And, I, and for a while there, for almost like two years, I used to open up the church at 12 o'clock for prayer. And I would go and open the church and I'd do a one hour prayer time. And I'd be, and at first I, used to, I, I was, I was excited because, you know, people asked for it. And, and I was like, hey, Bendrick, how you doing? And so I was, I was excited because, you know, people asked for it. And I was like, they're going to come to prayer and they're going to come to prayer. And I started doing it and I was doing it. And then people weren't coming. And I was the only one there and I started getting frustrated. And I was there and I was mad. I was walking around praying like, God, Hey, these people ain't here. And he's like, but are you doing it for them? Or are you doing it to talk with me? And it took a year of me opening the church at 12 o'clock and just going to prayer and being in prayer and realize this was really for me. This was to change my prayer life because I had my own prayer time. And listen to me, I can pray. I can pray for hours. I can talk to God. I have no problem. You know, I, I, you, you want to have a 24-hour prayer meeting? Call me. I'll be a part. I'll, I'll pray for six hours. I have no problem with that. Uh, but what I realized is I had to change how I did my prayer because my prayer was always the formal on my knees talking. And then I st after I read Philipp uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, this is pray, all, pray without ceasing. And then I realized my posture in prayer doesn't have to be specifically just a physical one. 
Now I talk to the Lord while I'm walking through the house and cleaning something. Or I talk to the Lord while I'm driving. I'm sitting there quiet by myself. Or I talk to the Lord before I, when I'm in the closet. I sit down in the closet. Lord, what do you, what do you even want me to wear today? Because I realize that everything that I do, whatever I do, even the things that I put on, help to create an opportunity to open the door for someone to be able to talk or for me to talk to them about the Lord. Right? When it says, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. It means for those who aren't just interested in trying to keep rules and regulations, but who are in love with him, who are with him all the time. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> my wife said, I'll pray the whole 24. you right. I knew it. I had no problem. I'll talk. I can talk to God. I can, because there's plenty of stuff I can pray for. And the Holy Spirit will bring it to my mind. But here's the thing. I realized that, again, it's not a competition. It's not that I really just want to be able to, to be able to connect with him. And how many know that sometimes talking a whole lot ain't really communication? Man, ladies, let me help you something. A whole, the, the volume of your talking to that man is not helping. He heard it. And even though he hadn't learned how to properly process and how to talk back or how to even share with you that he heard you or to be able to say that he understands or or, or for him to be able to give you an answer because he may not be able to have the words right then. Uh, here's what I encourage you to do. Learn that it's not the volume or the number of words. When I say volume, I mean not sound like loudness. I'm talking about the volume as in the greatness or how many words that you use that, that gets you there. Uh, uh, Haiti, but uh, but what it does is it brings us to a place to where we understand even the more of what God is calling us to, and so we can flow with Him, and so that we can learn how to be able to just be comfortable in His presence. When I talk with my wife, you know, sometimes I talk a lot, and then there's sometimes when she talks a lot, and then there's sometimes when we don't even talk, we're just kind of together, and even still. It's still connection. It's still communication. There's sometimes when we have a whole conversation with our eyes and <laughs> you could be right in the middle or you could be in the room with us and have no idea what we talk about. We'd be like. And we'd be hungry. Whole conversation. What the Lord's looking for is for us to be able to have a conversation with him, have a relationship that's so close, that's so unique that we can be able to connect with him. And it does not, sometimes it don't require all the words. If you just remember, just look in the scripture, it says sometimes the Holy Spirit wants to make intercession with groanings and utterings because we don't even know what to pray for. We don't even know what to do for. <laughs> Shh, Bedrick, don't start that, don't start that. Listen, I, I want to go to, uh, I, I, I know that, that our, our lesson is in First Peter. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to, I want to just, just kind of, uh, I can't do this lesson. Can I keep going with the way we're going? Is it all right if I keep going with, off, off the script? Because you know I'll freestyle me. Can I keep going off script? Holy Spirit. All right, so let's let's go one more place. I want to take you one more place. Um, we were in uh, <clears throat> we were in Romans chapter eight, right? Uh, let's go over. I want to go to First Peter. Uh, now I want to go to First Peter chapter. Let's see. Let's go to uh, First Peter chapter. Uh, let's go to chapter chapter five and chapter five. First Peter five. And again, we're still talking about active faith. We're still talking about um, we're still talking about active faith. And the the part about active faith that I want you to grab a hold of is and and, and again, going back to what what First Peter was sharing with us, uh, he he's specifically saying that part of uh, our active faith requires us to not be uh, to not be like the world, but to be holy like the Lord is, and to model holiness and to model holiness and, and modeling holiness right now during this whole COVID-19 scare, during this whole uh, uh, dealing with, with you know, uh, trying to homeschool your kids and, and, and trying to learn how to, uh, for a few of y'all, you are in the face of your spouse many more hours than you're used to, or the face of your significant other, and you are trying to figure out how not to go stir crazy bonkers because, oh my gosh, I need a break. <laughs> right, well, watch this. Um, 
active faith in this season right now um, does again, and, and I said, be careful. I'm, I'm not telling you to do anything foolish. I'm not telling you to go. And I, like I said on Sunday, I'm not telling you to go out and start licking elevator buttons to prove to people that you believe that if, uh, if I touch any deadly thing, or if we take any deadly thing, that it will not hurt us. Yes. The scripture does say that he does say that. However, he also says for us to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. He also tells us to be, to, to understand and to, uh, to that the, our people, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. You have the knowledge of what to do to stay safe. Pay attention to it. It also says, according to uh, Romans chapter uh, 13, uh, that it requires us to obey the laws of the land and to obey the laws of men, uh, just like uh, the laws of God. Only when the laws of men and the laws of God are contradictory that we choose the laws of God above the laws of men. All right. So if the laws of the, of, the, of the land or the laws of the land specifically say something and it's not contrary to what God says, then abide by the laws of the land. If, if, if they're saying that you can't congregate, if you can't do these things, it's OK. Be safe, be obedient. But here's what I want to encourage you with specifically if we're going to be these active faith uh, uh, representatives being holy. Um, when you're praying and the Holy Spirit says, all right, I want you to right now stop what you're doing and I want you to get some some supplies. I want you to gather some things and I want you to deliver them specifically over to uh, this individual because uh, this person, this uh, this family needs it. And you don't even know it, but you go and deliver it. And uh, once you deliver it, you knock on the door and you leave it on the stoop and you walk away and uh, and, and and you get maybe a, maybe you don't even get a thank you. Maybe you don't get a phone call later, but I promise you it's in moments like that where you are the light to where the Lord has called you to be. I can't tell you the number of times where the Lord has called us to do something like that. And uh, the family that was in need or the persons that received the, the benefit or that received the, the word of encouragement or that even received the card with the seed in it um, where they were <clears throat> literally broken into tears or or they tell the story about how it was to the letter or to the number of what they needed because uh, there was a pressing need or there was a situation and they, they weren't able to tell anybody about it because they were shamed. But God, they, they prayed, Lord, uh, God, if, if, you, if you're really real, it, you, Lord, you'll, you'll make a way and I don't know how you'll do it. And then you, the Lord uses you to do that. Here's what being holy looks like. Again, <clears throat> being holy means specifically following the lead of the Lord and being the example that he requires in the earth. When, when Jesus gives us the model prayer and he says, uh, Lord, <clears throat> uh, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He literally is giving us the opportunity to choose that his kingdom reign in earth. And when I say in earth, I'm not talking about in the, the planet. I'm talking about in this earth suit. Because when he reigns in here, then the planet gets changed. <clears throat> According to Genesis chapter 2, remember, he gave the earth, the dominion of the earth to man. So the only way that the earth is going to change or the earth gets formed is that the earth, this earth has to be changed first. That when this earth gets changed, then that earth gets changed. That when this earth gets, gets, gets conformed to the will of the Lord, then the rest of the planet gets conformed to the will of the Lord. And how that operates or how that manifests is a direct result of us putting ourselves in a position in a place to allow the Lord to use us for his glory. I said, uh, first Peter five, right? Go with me. First Peter five. I want to start at, <clears throat> and again, we're talk, still talking about active faith. I want to start at verse one. We're going to go down to probably to verse 10, but uh, let's just go through. Watch this. It says <clears throat> elders, the elders, which are among you, I exhort who also, who I am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Remember, now let's go back. Uh, remember, I, I said that uh, um, I think that was where, where were we? What was it? Uh, um, I think it was it was it Romans eight. Uh, yes, it was Romans 8. So it says, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Well, let's look over here in Peter. Peter references almost the same things. He does still acknowledge the fact that there is going to be struggle, trouble. There's going to be, still be strife. There's, there, there's still going to be issues. There's still going to be matters. There's still going to be world uh Things on the on the on the world's uh, uh, platform that will uh, love to try to scare us out of operating in faith. Uh, understand this: um, <clears throat> there there are times where uh, the where those who stood for the name of Christ uh, in the Scripture, and we read it, where, where their lives 
were, were challenged because of the simple fact that because they chose the name of Christ, you know, and I'm not saying go and put yourself in front of somebody's bullet and say, you know, I stand for Jesus and I'm going to, I'll die for him. No, but what I am saying is make sure that nothing prioritizes itself above God. So when he says, listen, I'm an elder and, and, I, and I realize and, I, and I've witnessed the sufferings of Christ. I saw him go through and I'm also a partaker of his glory that that's going to be revealed because we still have yet to see what he's going to do. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. There's still yet more to come. There's still yet more present, more to come. Uh, uh, you know, do I'm um, sorry. Uh, Daniel chapter seven has given us prophetic examples and, and all of Romans tells us. And if you don't believe it or not, if you don't want to believe it, I, I want to believe that, that I think we're closer to the end times than ever. I think that the, the, the wars and rumors of wars, the pestilence, the, the famine, the, the sickness, all the things that were promised prophesied, what's to come in the scripture are beginning to fall in line they're falling in place so having active faith means that now we need to be an active part partner and a participant in what god is doing so that when his kingdom come and his will gets done in earth as it is in heaven that it, when it changes us it changes our surroundings it changes the people that we're connected to it changes the people that we are affecting look at uh first uh, peter five again i'm still here verse two says feed the flock of god which is among you Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. In other words, he's telling us, be ready to share with people about what you believe in. To share with people the gospel of the kingdom of God. To share with them that he is a king, that he reigns forever, that he was and he is and he is to come. I can't see you. I can't see you. I can't see you. Oh, okay. She's telling me I got to shut down. She's telling me I got to bring it in. I don't think we need to bring it in because it's online and they can pause it and watch it later. I'm going to keep going. All right. <laughs> watch this. All right. I'm going to try to wrap this up. All right. So watch this. He says, uh, feed the flock of God, which is among you. Make sure that you're sharing the gospel, right? Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre. Not that you're looking to get anything from anybody because I promise you, you can't. No, no, nobody can give you more than what God can. No, nobody can, 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 don't get, be careful of getting in the habit of receiving just because uh, you are a blessing. I, I wrestle sometimes when people want to be a blessing to me because I, I, I want to, I want to, I know that the gospel is the greater blessing. So I want to give to them and I want them to be able to receive. But I also have to realize that, 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 Sometimes I have to be able to be fertile ground for someone else to sow into me. I have a whole rust with that. But let's keep looking. He says, don't do it for filthy lucre. Don't look for don't do it for, for, for riches. But he says, be ready in mind. Verse three, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples of the flock. Not to beat people overhead with the gospel, but to be a shining example of what it looks like to be holy. But to to be an active example, to be a, an active working model. Um, I used to love to go to the car show when I was a kid, because when we used to go to the car show as a kid, they used to have all these prototypes. Nowadays, car shows just have what the manufacturers going to give out next year. So they want to they want to get you excited about buying the car versus showing you future concepts and i love to look at the future concepts car because i wanted to see you know how we want to drive in that flying car in 2020 which we didn't get yet but i love the idea of what it of showing of us what it could be but what what the car show has now become is it shows you a working example of what you can be or what you can have and, and what you can have very soon and so what he's calling us to be is today's car show he's telling us be the example what people can become right now Show them a tangible example, a working example of what it looks like to live this life for the Lord, right? Verse uh, four, and we, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The chief shepherd is Jesus, all right? He says that when he comes, he's going to reward you with a crown because of you being an active faith example, right? Keep going. Verse five, likewise, you younger submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Boom. He talks about having respect of relationship in 
age or in, in maturity. Watch this. And when I say in age and maturity, when the reason this is important is if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy 6 specifically says when, when he's preparing Israel to go into the promised land, he tells them to teach your children and your children's children. Right. So we're talking about three generations worth of 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 the testimony of who God is and models or examples of living this life for God lives before each generation. So each generation gets the opportunity or the privilege to be able to see what it looks like, what I can become in the faith if I keep pressing forward. So the patriarch generation gets to show the 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 the, the children's generation. Uh, here's what it looks like. And, and, and if you believe God, uh, this is what can happen. The 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 uh, the the. The, the children's generation are the ones that when they have kids, they're the ones who, who say, listen, just don't do my stupid and trust God. The, the youngest generation get the opportunity to benefit from two other examples, and then they glean from all of it so that they understand what they can become, how to navigate and grow in this. And when I say that, we're not just talking about physical generations, but we're talking about also discipleship. Because when you are a disciple maker, or when you're teaching people how to live this life like God or how to live this life for the Lord, that it should produce they should produce disciples and they should also produce disciples. In other words, they should also be generations of disciple makers. <clears throat> Look at what it says. Humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, <clears throat> that you may exalt, that he may exalt you in due time. Humble yourselves. Don't puff yourself up. You, you, you stop changing your name on Facebook to prophet and, and apostle and just be, just be. Just be, because if you operate in the office of a prophet, you operate in the office, but you are not the office. If you are, you, you, yes, you, you, that, your title is not your name. And, and prayerfully, if you make it, God ain't gonna call you by your title. He, he's gonna call you by your name. And, and if you live right, hopefully he'll call you by the name that he's got written in a white stone waiting for you according to Revelations. So having said that, he says, listen, humble yourselves. Stop, stop blowing yourself up. Stop smelling yourself. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Let him be the one that promotes you. Watch this. Casting your care upon him, for he careth for you. That's going back to the whole portion of revelation, that, well, I'm sorry, relationship that we talked about earlier, about growing in a position of being in love or being in love with God and what he loves about you and loving what he loves about you. Do you know that the stuff that you hate about you, God still loves? The stuff that I'm going to say that again, the stuff that you hate about you, God loves. Let him love the stuff that you hate so he can teach you how to love the stuff that you don't like. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Your enemy does not want you to be an active example of faith. He does not want you to live holy. He wants you to compromise. He wants to scare you into compromise. He wants to scare you into shutting your mouth. He wants to scare you into, into, into dialing back and not becoming who God's called you to be. Verse 9, who res whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, let me say this a different way. You're not the only one going through. You're not the only one having issues. You're not the only one suffering. You're not the only one who's who's having a, a situation. And, and, I, and, and I hate to say it, but right now we are having the opportunity to watch one thing make the whole world be on the same page. Now, the scripture says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive sin and heal the land. <clears throat> I reference that verse because um, I don't know if you all remember 9-11 when, when, when September uh, 11th happened. And uh, for a while, the whole nation of the U.S. found its way on its knees to, to love and to pray to God. It got our attention. Right now, there is an agent that the enemy is using that has brought commonality to every tongue, to every nation, to every creed, to every currency. And the one thing that we all have in common right now is this aggressive attack that's happening. And yet, no matter what name they call it, there is a name above every other name. 
no matter what they are, no matter what uh, uh, the symptoms are, the solution is always Jesus. And right now, this is an opportunity for the whole world to fall on his knees, to fall in love with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not just because we're trying to uh, not be hurt or not be sick. Uh, I'm reminded of in, in, in Exodus when uh, Israel was on their way to the promised land and en route to the promised land, they were going through the mountains and these vipers, the scripture says these fiery serpents came out and started biting the people and the snakes were biting them. And the Lord told Moses to make a brazen serpent, put it on a staff and then to hold it up. So first of all, they're going through this while this is happening. Somebody's making a brazen serpent. Right. And then they're putting it on a staff. So a lot is all happening. And then they lift it up and he tells them as long as they look at this serpent, as long as they look at what's on the top of the staff, that they will be, they will not die. Watch this, that they won't die. Not that they won't get bit, not that it won't hurt, not that the venom won't course through their veins, not that it won't sting, or that they won't feel the sting, but that they won't die. Right now, the Lord is giving us an opportunity to be holy, to lift him up, so that the world can be able to see him and live and not die. Whew. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. This isn't the end. Keep going. Verse 10, it says, but the God of all grace. And now, again, this is right after it talks about our enemy who's seeking who may devour, walking around as a wrong lion. He ain't no lion, but uh, uh, my wife likes to say he's, he's like a, a kitty cat with a megaphone. Wow. Oh. You know, he's he, he trying to make you think that he's got the authority and power. But remember, God already gave you all the power. Scripture says, Jesus said, behold, I give you power over all the power of the enemy and nothing by enemy shall harm you. So if you keep your mind or your gaze or your heart or your mind and your heart focused on him in relationship with him, it don't mean that you won't experience the hurt. It won't mean that you won't go through some of the pain. It won't mean that you won't.